mercy, the power of the blood of Jesus. We give you praise and worship. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Master. Praise God. Praise God. Does anybody have any prayer requests today? Barb uh, has an infection in her um, tooth, and she's on antibiotics, and it's swollen, and she's in pain, so she needs mm -hmm. prayer, and um, Sherry asked for prayer as well, because she's in pain, so she needs prayer. Jesus name. Mm -hmm. Let's pray for uh, Sister mm -hmm. Pat Leach, her husband who passed away there yesterday, mm -hmm. and her so her pet's up to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's also pray for uh, Weekend that's coming up, not this weekend, but the next weekend. We'll request that. Anybody else? Amen. Let's just pray, Lord. We love you. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. Thank you for your power, God. We pray for you to touch those that are sick and body, to touch Barb, to touch Sherry, to touch God, we pray for you to touch Sister Pathy. We pray that your hand will be upon the whole family. God, as they are grieving for us, God, we pray in the name of Jesus for your mercy to reach, for your goodness to touch. God, let the power of your spirit do the work of Jesus. You are the living God, Lord, and there is nobody like you, Jesus. Please reach down and minister your grace, O oh God. Touch and anoint and strengthen God in the name of Jesus. Pray that you work your will, God, because you are God. You are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask. God, touch things in this new revival. Pray that you touch even this Father's Day service, God, coming up. God, bless, Lord, minister your grace, God. Touch me, Jesus, God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your word, God. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness, Jesus. God, we pray in the name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus. Reach down, God, that your will be done in every heart and every day and every life. The will of God be done. Work your perfect will in the name of Jesus, Master. Thank you for what you're doing, God. Thank you for what you're doing, God. Praise is Jesus. Praise is Jesus. Miss of Jesus, did all he has done for me. My soul cries out, Hallelujah! Praise God for saving me. When I think of the goodness of Jesus, and all he has done. chapter 8, or verse 8, I should say, 2 John, verse 8, and also Matthew chapter 18 and verse 11. So 
That's 2 John, verse 8. And Matthew 18 and verse 11. 2 John, verse 8, it says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, that we receive, but that we receive a full reward. And also uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 11. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. I'd like to direct your attention to the middle portion of that first verse. It says that we lose not those things. We need to look to ourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought. I want to look at the subject tonight, lost things. Lost things. Praise God. Have you ever lost anything before? People lose things. All of us at one time or another have experienced loss. Everything from different degrees of losing things from your keys to uh, much more profound things than that. Most people that lose things wind up at some point or another finding those things again. But other things, it seems like once you've lost them, you'll never see them again. And that's the peril of lost things, is the possibility of those, that being a forever thing. Losing stuff is not fun. Uh, it provokes emotions in a person's heart, like anger, frustration, guilt, fear, regret, sadness, uh, and a host of other things, but none of it good. Uh, I've never lost something like my wallet and been happy about it. <laughs> um, so our text, uh, it says very clearly that we are to look to ourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we would receive a full reward. We gotta, tonight we want to uh, look at these things. There's some things that are very, very important, very valuable, um, that go far beyond losing anything that you've ever maybe lost on this earth. These are spiritual things, spiritual treasures, things that we have wrought in God, things that God has placed in our lives, things that God has given us, valuable treasures, uh, and we are admonished to look to ourselves. Tonight, we want to examine ourselves as we go over these things. We want to look at 10 things tonight, 10 things that, that is a possibility that if we, look, uh, if we look at it, it's possible that it's for a person to lose these things if they are not careful. So the first thing that we want to look at is it's possible to lose hope. Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 11. Now this is Israel. This is God's people. Israel said, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Our hope is lost. Israel, this was God's people, had been uh, so downtrodden. They felt so at, their, at the bottom of the, of, of the pit that they, that they felt that their hope was clean gone, that it was lost. Uh, that there was no more hope. Acts chapter 27 and verse 20, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. So again, even in the New Testament, we find Paul at the time of uh, him being transported in that great uh, tempest, that hurricane that happened at sea, uh, they were about to be shipwrecked, and they had got to the place. They were so scared, they thought that their hope was clean taken away. There was no more hope. That's kind of, we kind of came up a lot, last few times, hasn't it, that subject of hope. It seems like it keeps kind of popping its head up. Hope is important, um, and it's something that we got we to gotta keep right to the very end. It's not good enough that we had hope when we were first saved, but we got to keep and maintain that hope. Uh, the Scriptures goes as far as to say that we are saved by hope. It, it, it's, it's that important. So tonight as we go through these things, these possibilities of things that we are warned in Scripture about losing, we also want to, with each situation, look at the remedy or the answer. What do we do when we lose our hope? Have you ever been to that point where you've just been that far down? Um, the answer is found in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul declared the Lord Jesus Christ is our hope. Now, if you were looking for something more profound than that, you're not going to find anything more, more profound than Jesus. But it's also a simple answer. Um, it doesn't matter what you've lost and how horrible the situation is or the circumstance is, 
If you've got Jesus, you've got hope. He is our hope. And uh, we never need to be in despair when we have Jesus. He's only a prayer away at the very most. Matter of fact, if we just remind ourselves, he had said and promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. He's going to be with us always. Praise God. So we need to look to ourselves that we don't ever lose hope. I don't think anybody is there tonight. I don't think there's any people that are so far down here tonight. Here's another thing that it's a possibility to lose, and that is your influence. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Maybe we can have a little bit of interaction tonight. What are some things, what do you think Jesus is talking about here when he said, you are the salt of the earth? Can anybody explain this to me? Do a commentary on this verse for me? Salt adds flavor. Okay, so salt influences the food. It influences the flavor of the food. It enhances it. So it changes the flavor. What, what else does salt do? It preserves. It preserves. That's right. So you can put a little bit, I've never done it, but apparently you have a jar of cucumbers and water. You can throw some salt in there, seal it up, and it turns into pickles. It preserves those things, just a little bit of salt. Yeah. It kills. Yeah. So it disinfects. And it kills. Yeah, the plants, it is sweating the plants. It was part of the strategy of the enemy. Oh, okay. So into the plants, it would kill the crops. Yeah. Yeah, so th that's one way to look at it. There's seeds that the devil is trying to sow, and, uh, and we have that ability. I've never actually looked at it like that before. That's cool. But it also uh, disinfects Heels. as well. Heals, yeah. Have you ever, I remember one time, um, it's kite surfing in the ocean, and I cut myself on some coral or whatever, and I thought, oh man, this can wreck my holiday. But in a couple of days, it was gone. Like it was completely healed, just being in that water. And salt water. Any, anything else? What else does salt do? Yeah? It's when you have a very heavy rock and you put salt in it, it will float. Oh, okay. That's an interesting thing, like the Dead Sea, right? The Dead Sea. Huh? So there's salt. The, the, the underlying premise, the underlying premise of salt is that it influences, right? And it's possible for us to lose our influence if we are not careful, because Jesus said, "You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewithal shall it be salted?" If that salt loses its influential power, it becomes nothing but just a substance. Um, you can't even throw it onto the ground and it be useful. It doesn't do any good. You can't even melt snow if it loses its savor, it loses its influence. Um, and it's possible for, for, for this to happen if we are not careful. Um, that can happen, I suppose, if a person stops witnessing, starts letting their light so shine before men, or um, loses that focus of the lost, um, and we stop influencing our 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 workplaces and whatnot. But, uh, so it is possible to lose this. But what is the answer? The answer is simple as found in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. If you ever feel like you're getting a little dry, a little cold, a little... Because that's the problem, right? Revival, it was just said this last Sunday, revival is not when sinners come into the church, it's when God's people get revived. And it starts in us. So if we get revived through the power of the Holy Ghost, then we automatically will gain that influential factor back to us once again. We can reconstitute our salt in the presence of God through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now here's another thing we can lose if we're not careful, and that you can lose your ground. What's the biblical word for losing ground? Backsliding. It's not a very pretty word, but it is a very descriptive word. You slide backwards. It's not something you do on purpose. Um, it's something that just happens. Um, you never front slide, do you? It's not something that you never, every bit of ground that we ever gain, we're always having to fight for it. But backsliding, you don't have to do anything and you'll just slip backwards. Um, 2 John verse 8, in the Amplified Version, it says, Look to yourselves, take care that you may not lose, throw away, or destroy all that you have labored for, 
but that you may per- persevere until you win and receive back a perfect reward in full. So we've got to be careful that we do not lose um, our ground in God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, Wherefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Um, must never let things slip. We can't let ourselves slip and backslide. And uh, Now what is that? What exactly is backsliding? Backsliding, you might think of that person that was once on fire for God is now a drug addict in the gutters. That's the extreme of backsliding. But if you really look at what backsliding is, you have the pinnacle of where you are in God, the closest, the most closest relationship you've had. If you ever slip backwards from that, it is backsliding, isn't it? It's losing ground. It's slipping backwards. Um, you must fight to hold your ground in God. Remember Shammah and his pea patch? Just his little pea patch. And the Philistines came, came upon them, and he fought, and he did not allow the, the enemy to come in and take his little, his little parcel of ground. It wasn't anything huge. It wasn't a vast amount of real estate, but it was his, and it was his inheritance from, uh, from, from, from God. And he was not about to give that up. So what is the answer? What is the answer if a person does lose their ground? Uh, the answer is found in Joel chapter 2, verse 25. God said, I will restore unto you the years that the locusts hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Praise God. God is able to restore that which the enemy takes away. Uh, thank God for that. Have you ever read in your Bible that God is able to heal backslidings, that term? He said he promised Israel that he could heal their backslidings. So again, the answer is just in God. The answer is found in him, in, in his power, in his love, in his mercies. We can gain our ground back in God if we ever lose it. Here's another thing that you can lose if, we got it, if we're not careful, and you can lose your joy. Psalms chapter 137, verses 1 through 4, But the, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps on the willow trees, in the midst thereof, for there they carried us away captive, requiring of, of us a song. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So they had lost their joy. They, they had lost their song. Um, that's what Satan would like to do. He, he, he wants to attack us in any way that he can. If he can steal our joy, then he knows that he has the upper hand because the joy of the Lord is what? It is our strength. When we have God's joy bubbling inside of us, there is a strength that is an irreplaceable strength. And if that's gone, uh, woe unto us. And they were in despair. They had hung their harps up on the willow trees, and they said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Psalms 51 and verse 12, David said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. So we understand that in that psalm, David is repenting of his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah and all of that. Um, and he said, restore unto me. So David understood the capacity that God had to restore joy. Now the answer to that, how, do we, how does God restore joy? How does he do that? Well, Psalm 16 in verse 11, it says, Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's amazing what praising can do. It's amazing what one prayer meeting can do. Amen. When you are down and you are depressed, amen, you can cast that spirit of heaviness off, put on the garment of praise. Praise God for the spirit of heaviness. And in his presence is fullness of joy. So don't despair. I don't care if you have lost your hope. There's answers. There is an answer. If you lose your influence, if you lose ground, or even if you lose your joy, there is the answer in God. Here's another thing that we are warned in Scripture about, and we can lose our footing if we are not careful. Psalms chapter 30, 73 and verse 2. The psalmist said, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had nigh well slipped. Now, here's another question for you. What is so bad about s- slipping? What is so bad about slipping? Slippage. 
What happened? Uh, yeah. Is that what happened to your head? <laughs> you just ran into the corner of a table? No. No? You tripped. I mean, I burned the table. Did you trip into it? Did you slip in and fall into it? I was playing. Playing, okay. I was playing today too. <laughs> yeah. Praise God. Um, babysat a couple of kids, three kids today. It was, it was interesting. <laughs> um, so uh, we're asking ourselves how. Uh, what's so bad about slipping? Is the slipping what's so bad? <laughs> yeah, it's the landing. That's what I think. Because usually people don't just slip, but they slip and fall. And it's the fall that is so devastating. When a person falls from God, there's a lot in Scripture about falling. Like you can fall from grace. Um, yep. But what I garner from this slippage is you're climbing a hill. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a flat surface or a plane, you're climbing a hill. So when you do slip, you lose ground. There's that too. Or you slip, um, you're, going, you're going upstream and you slip, you go a long way away. Yeah. So it, the, the consequence is dire. Yeah, so, yeah, so there's backslide involved mm -hmm. as well. Uh, losing your ground. Yeah, these things kind of overlap for sure. Um, so what happens? Okay, you've fallen. The impact, the embarrassment. Have you ever, have you ever slipped on ice and just fallen right on your bunk? And... <laughs> yeah. So it's happens, right? Yeah, it's like oh. <laughs> yeah. It can be embarrassing, and if we. Yeah. So if you fall, you know, if you fall in 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 church setting, people know about it. It can be embarrassing. It can be, it can be. Hard, right? That's why the scripture talks about, you know, consider yourself, lest you also be tempted, you know? Restore that brother that has fallen, considering yourself. Because nobody's above slippage. Nobody's above the possibility of falling. So, yeah, it can be hard and it can be difficult. And there's a lot of other things, more than embarrassment, but there's shame and there's pain involved in falling. Um, you know, that the pain that you are in and the pain that you know that you put God in. Because whenever we transgress and sin, it, it's not good. Um, what's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So what's the answer? What's the answer? When you lose your footing. Well, Psalms chapter 17 and verse 5, it says, Hold up my goings in thy paths that my footsteps slip not. David was actually specifically praying about that. Saying, God, don't let me fall. Keep me up. He's able to keep us from falling. Have you read that in your Bible? He's able to keep us from falling. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. That's a picture of what God is able to do. You know, um, have, you, have you ever seen a, uh, a newborn deer? You know, you got this elegant little awkward beast, you know, quite a bit of weight, and then these spindly long legs, and there's no, you know, there's no balance there. And that's how we are when we're first born in the kingdom of God. We've We've got potential, we can see what God, you know, but we're very weak and unstable. But then God is able to establish, strengthen, and settle us. And he puts proper legs under us. And he, he, he's able to make our, hinds, our feet like hinds feet. You know, that's like the deer that, sh that have you ever seen video footage or whatever, maybe a, of those mountain goats that go up sheer, almost sheer cliff? I mean, it's amazing what they're able to do with just those little hooves and they dig in and, their balance is incredible, but God is able to give us that kind of uh, answer. He can keep us from falling, keep us from losing our footing. Uh, here's another thing that we can lose if we're not careful, and that is our love. Revelation 2, verses 4 through 5, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You've left your first love. Now, this was written again to the church. This was one of the rebukes that 
that this particular church had received. They left their first love. Uh, now, I know that if we look at it specifically here, it says left. It didn't say they lost their first love. They left it. It was, it was like it was a conscious decision that they had made somewhere along the line to leave God's love behind. Um, or they left the place of where that first love was, which was the presence of God. So they left that place. Um, divorce is rampant in our society. Have you noticed that? Uh, it's, uh, I think in Canada, at least I know that uh, probably it's like that in the United States as well, but I know that it's more than 50% of the marriages that will wind up in divorce uh, that get started. But you know what? None of them think that when they're walking down the aisle. They all think that they're going to last forever. What's that? What's the, what's the key? The key is that first love because they are just, they look at each other and they're just so in love. They can't imagine it ever changing. But somewhere along the line, that love is lost in that, in that marriage situation and it gets to the point where they have to separate and divorce. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a love relationship that we have with God. Um, we must not lose our love. So what is the answer if we lose our love? If we start feeling like that love of God, that, yeah. I knew where it was. Um, there's one in the New Testament that says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. There's also one in the Old Testament. And it's worded a little bit differently. But it's beautiful. It just basically means you lean into me and I'll lean into you. Mm. As the world would understand it to be. See if you can find that scripture. I'd like to see it. Okay. That's important. That's good. Doesn't so, it say in that scripture to go back and do your first works? Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's what I have in my notes here, Susan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the very next verse. It says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, repent and do the first works. Remember the first works. What are some first works that you have when you first come to God? You have a deep repentance. And you're very sensitive to that, right? Like, I mean, you're trying to shed every bit of worldliness off and the habits and the, all that stuff. Well, what else? A hunger for God. You've you got that desire for more of God when you're first in the church. Yeah. The zeal. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Teach me, teach me, teach me. Give me Bible studies. Yeah. You just want it. You want no, no, no. The zeal. You, you want to tell everybody. You're just so excited about Jesus. Anything else? What's that? What's the first works? How about your prayer life? How about the basic disciplines? I mean, when you're first in church, that's one of the first things you're taught is you got to get a prayer life. You got to praise God. You got to pay your tithes. You got to do your first works. And if you do these disciplines, uh, that's the answer here. But remember, it's all about reestablishing that foundation, that first works. You can go back and, and repair your foundation. Uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And again, the answer is found by repenting, doing your first works, getting in the presence of God, because that love of God can get shed abroad in our hearts again. Here's another one. We're on number seven now. Um, you can lose your vision. And what happens when you lose your vision? You start losing your determination. You start losing your resolve. Your Things begin to slip. Proverbs 29 and verse 18, where there's no vision, the people perish. Um, here's a passage of scripture that I saw years ago that I found very intriguing. 2 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 8. For the battle there was scattered over the face of the country, and the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. I think that's so, it's poetic almost the way it is. But you can see them, they were in the thick of battle. And, uh, and, and the enemy was, 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 they were battling the enemy, and they somehow found themselves battling within a deep, thick forest. And it says here that the wood devoured more people than the sword did that day. What's, what is that talking about? I believe it's talking about vision. Have you ever been in the middle of a deep forest, like in the middle of a really thick forest? You've got all that, the branches and the foliage and the underbrush and I mean, you need a machete to hack through this stuff. That's what I visualize when I read this passage. Like the wood, it, it, it's like they, they couldn't see five, three feet in front of their face because of all the leaves and, the, and stuff. And that's the problem. I think that's what that this is kind of talking about more than anything is uh, losing, they get disorientated within that thick of the forest. When you lose your vision, 
people perish. So what's the answer? Um, it's Jesus. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Matthew 20, verse 34, the two blind men, remember Jesus had compassion on them, touched their eyes, and immediately they received their sight and they followed him. So again, you lose your vision, nobody like Jesus to restore your vision. He's the sight giver. There's just a couple more. You can lose your hearing. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11, it says, Of whom we have many things to say and, and hard to be uttered, seeing that you are dull of hearing. Dull of hearing. Um, it's kind of interesting, but in the natural, generally speaking, the older you get, your hearing becomes diminished, right? Until you need hearing aids when you're an old person. and Perhaps you might go deaf. You're always going, eh? <laughs> and uh, you, you don't hear as well. And it can happen spiritually. You know, you hear so much preaching, at least a couple of times a week. You know, plus the, the word that you're in. And, you know, year after year, you hear all this stuff, and pretty soon you're thinking to yourself, well, I've heard this before. Uh, and this isn't, you know, I've, this is just old hat. And you start kind of pushing that preaching off to your neighbor and saying, well, I already got that one. I already saw that in Scripture. It's no big deal to me. And we become dull of hearing. Because it's not just about hearing something fresh all the time. Sometimes we need to be reminded of things that we've already heard. And that's part of it. Um, has anybody ever had bacon and eggs twice in their life? It was good the second time too, right? So it's a matter of perspective. Just because it's not something that's brand new and sparkly. Uh, as long as it is fresh off the Lord's table, it's good food. And if we're hungry, then our hearing will be affected by that. And if we, are, and if we become kind of old and crusty, then our hearing can become, we can become dull of hearing, spiritual hearing. Um, remember, the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing. If we become dull of hearing, what happens to our faith? It starts going down. It, it diminishes in our, it, we just get cold and lukewarm in God. So preaching is what saves us, right? So what's the answer? Again, it's Jesus. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus in, in, encountered the deaf and mute man, and he said, be opened. He spoke to his ears, and he said, be opened. You know, that's what we have to do. Our spiritual hearing, we have to have open hearts to receive God's word, to be able to hear what God is trying to tell us uh, from across a pulpit or when we're reading our Bible or when God is talking to us, we got to be make sure that our ears are in tune to what he's having to say. Um, number nine, you can lose your way. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse six, we all like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. Sheep need constant guidance and supervision because they are prone to wandering away. They're prone to wandering away. I, yesterday, um, I opened my trailer door and my dog did a Superman leap from the trailer out into the ground. As soon as he hit the ground, he took off, or she took off, Abby, that little wiener dog, and she ran. And I was yelling after it, chasing it, until finally I caught up with the thing and uh, grabbed it. But she's prone to going astray. That's why I always got to remember to put a leash on her. But sheep are prone to going astray. Um, we're talking about the good shepherd here. What's, what, what did the good shepherd do? Went after the one sheep. When we all, like sheep, have gone astray, we've all went down a wrong path, but then there's a good shepherd that's constantly looking out for us. And, uh, and it's interesting, that, that verse there where it talks about he left the 99 in the wilderness and went, went after him. I believe that what he was doing was not just looking for him, but listening for that sheep. What are we supposed to do when we, are, when we go astray? We need to cry out to the good shepherd. That's what we need to do because a lot of times that's how shepherds find the sheep. You know, it's the, they're kind of camouflaged, they're, they're gray, and they kind of blend into the wilderness, but then you have, bleating of the sheep 
um, crying out and it gets the shepherd's attention. First Peter chapter 2, verse 25. For ye were as sheep going astray, but now are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. So we can lose our hope, we can lose our influence, we can lose our ground, we can lose our joy, we can lose our footing, we can lose our love, our vision, our hearing, we can lose our way. And here's the last thing, and this is the most serious thing, and that is we can lose our soul. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now there's a significant segment of Christianity that will say that that is an impossibility. That once you are saved, you are always saved. No matter what, you cannot be lost. If you are in Christ, you will be saved. Yeah. But the key thing is to remain in Christ. Yeah. But you can leave and come out of Christ. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I believe in eternal security, but I do not believe in unconditional eternal security. That's right. <laughs> you know, there is conditions to this salvation. Yes. And as long as we stay in the palm of the Master's hand, That's we're right. going to be okay. No man can pluck you out of the master's hand. Um, but it's the most serious thing. And this is the only thing that if you lose your soul, there is no answer for that. There's no answer for that. I watched a documentary here the other night and it was about people who died. And uh, they had these after-death experiences. And it's interesting. Um, one guy actually was, went to hell. And, and he was an atheist, and he cried out to Jesus in hell. And God apparently snatched him up. And Now, God can do anything. I'm, I, I don't know if that actually happened. I, I don't have any reason to not believe that that would happen, because God is God. But I'm not going to bank on that. <laughs> you know, like I'm not going to gamble with my soul. I'm going to make sure that I'm doing my best. Also, we must remember, this guy was an atheist, never went to church. To whom much is given, much shall be required. We know way too much to expect some kind of mercy like that. We, if we're going to be saved, we better be preparing now. We better stay prepared. Not let ourselves lose things. Because the scripture that we read, look to yourselves uh, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but we receive a full reward. We start losing one or two things, it, it can turn into a landslide and we will lose our soul. So we must not ever uh, look lightly at losing things in God. These are treasures. These are valuable things that we must always hold close to us. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27, Paul said, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. So all of these other losses have a remedy. But Paul understood the possibility of being cast away. This was the Apostle Paul. You know, um, if he considered the possibility of being lost, you know, after being saved, then we must, how much more should we consider that as well? So again, we want to look at uh, our first two verses of Scripture. It says, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but we receive a full reward. And then we read, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Yeah. God bless, bro. Um, so we have Jesus. We have Jesus. In any situation, he's the seeker and saver of that which is lost. Anybody have any comment or questions or additives? I'm just reading around that verse, that verse in Second John, and it's talking about losing doctrine. Right, losing the doctrine that was once delivered to you, right? You can lose that too. Go ahead and read it. It says, um, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is coming in flesh. This is the deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we so I mean and, and we've seen that, right? We've seen um, even pastors who um, once once preached, you know, truth, yeah, preach truth, preach holiness, um, losing that, losing their way. And it's interesting that 
that scripture that you, you said about um, more were lost in the forest. I I picture just someone. What happens? You get lost in the forest. You you lose your way. You get turned around. You don't have any signposts. You can't see. So you get lost. You, you get lost. You can't find your way out, right? Unless you happen to stumble back onto the trail again. So just not having those signposts, those those um, what do they call them? The the, the markers that they would. So it says move not in the markers, the ancient landmarks. landmarks. The landmarks, yeah. Don't move the landmarks, right? That was a big no-no in ancient Israel, right? Because that was your property lines. Like that was, if somebody came and moved your landmark, then you were, you lost, you lost property, right? So out there in the wilderness or in the forest, you're just, you can, you, you lose things. You have to keep that, that vision, that vision so strong that, you know, um, Brother Bernard does a podcast now, and it's just short little vignettes. Um, and he did one today on um, the eternal sonship, and I thought it was so good. It's just like ten minutes long, but and and you know, I just I just once again was like, God, I'm just so thankful that I don't have all this confusion about who you are. Mm-hmm. Like really, it's not a mystery, right? It's been revealed, like. It's not a mystery. It's so clear. And yet people are absolutely stumbling at the stumbling stone. They're losing out because they confess not that Jesus Christ was coming in the flesh. Right? That he's some eternal son from forever and ever. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. It's very, very good to know. It's just very something to, again, be thankful for. Amen. Mm-hmm. I like that way you said it, Donkey. It's very important. Mm-hmm. You gotta stay tied to that, right? Tied to the doctor. Anybody else? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. God, thank you for helping us, God. If we ever find ourselves, God, slipping or losing ground or God, losing our way, God, or losing things that are valuable, hope or joy. God, I pray that you help us to always cry out to you. Repent, God, and draw close to you. And make sure that we are cognizant, we're looking to ourselves, that we lose not anything, God, of value that you've given us. These are treasures, God, that we must cherish and protect, God. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it and praise you for it. Jesus, name.